For the last few weeks, I've been riding this bike behind me, the 2021 Kawasaki KLX 300. So with Yamaha's venerable WR250R discontinued for 2021, if you want an affordable, reliable Japanese dual sport bike under 600cc, you're pretty much limited to this, Honda's updated CRF300L, which I'll be testing shortly, and the ancient, but still really reliable and well-liked DRZ400. So with the punched out updated larger engine in this bike versus the old KLX 250 and pretty decent suspension, which we're gonna talk about as we get into the review, is this the perfect affordable Japanese dual sport bike that can satisfy both veteran riders and beginner riders? That's what we're gonna find out today. So stay tuned, let's get started. This is gonna be a good one. So first of all, I wanna extend a big thanks to Kawasaki USA and my media contact there, Brad, and his colleagues who helped set me up with this bike for the past few weeks. I really appreciate that. Here at Big Rock Media, my goal is to give you in-depth, detailed reviews instead of just test ride videos. Before I even start filming my reviews, I spend a week or two riding the bike, putting hundreds of miles on it, and really figuring out what the bike's all about before I start formulating my opinions on it and filming the videos. That's my goal for these reviews. I wanna go in depth. I wanna really give you the point of view of a more experienced rider who's ridden and owned a lot of the bikes out there. So for way, way too long, there's been a huge gap between something like a 250 Dual Sport and the 400s, and then you go up to the 650s. A lot of you might remember the old DR350, which was a very, very popular bike, which then got replaced by the DRZ400 in 2001. So both Kawasaki and Honda are coming to the table and answering this question, is a 300, something in that size category, the perfect all-around dual sport bike? I've spent a lot of time on the old KLX250 and I've owned a WR250R and I've also ridden the Honda 250L. And in my opinion, those bikes just needed a little bit more grunt to be usable as an all around dual sport bike. Something you're gonna take on the highway, go commuting with and do your dual sport runs with. So the question is, is the extra 50cc or so that they punched this out, does that give you enough extra torque, enough extra grunt to really make this a more usable motorcycle and something that could potentially replace maybe a DRZ400 or maybe your aging WR250? First impressions of the KLX, this is my first ride. Really enjoying it so far, it's really fun. The 300 provides just enough extra grunt over the old 250 that it's a lot more enjoyable to ride. You don't have to shift as much, you can leave it in third gear a lot and just cruise the trails. Um, pretty comfortable, the ergonomics are good. The seat is, you know, not great, but that's what I expected. Um, it's quiet, it's refined. The suspension is good. Uh, I mean, I'm just getting started with the bike, but the suspension, I enjoy it. It's, uh, you can carry quite a bit of speed on the trail. The rear shock, um, when I ride it pretty fast through some of the rougher terrain I can bottom it but that's kind of what I expected um, but it's it's not bad like you can ride it pretty fast I love this lime green color so yeah I'm having a blast out here it's a beautiful day above the clouds up here I don't know what's going on with this car here that doesn't seem right at all does it <laughs> looks like they tried to do some recovery but they they weren't successful so I'm not really sure but anyway I'm gonna keep riding it love the bike so far it's awesome fun. So let me briefly cover some of the specs you'll care about. I'm not going to go through every single little detail because you can look that up on the website, find that online, and I don't want this video to get long and boring. So here's the basics. The bike uses a 292cc fuel injected engine with an 11.1 to 1 compression ratio. It uses a 6-speed gearbox which is great instead of the 5-speed that you get like on something like a DRZ which was a huge limiting factor on that bike. The engine runs very smoothly at all RPMs and it does employ an engine counterbalancer to keep those vibrations in check. The fuel tank here is two gallons and we're going to talk about why that's a little bit limiting later on in the video. So what about the chassis and the suspension? So the bike has a 26.7 degree rake angle which contributes to really stable handling and not the twitchy feeling that some dirt bikes, some more aggressive dual sport bikes even, will have. So up front you have an inverted fork that uses 43 millimeter tubes and for adjustments you just have compression damping adjustment on the front. So for the front fork you don't get rebound damping adjustment or preload which would have been nice but we'll talk more about suspension later and the suspension on this bike is actually quite good for the price. 
So the rear suspension is a single monoshock unit, obviously, using Kawasaki's Unitrack system that they've been using for years. That's just the marketing name that they have. So the rear shock has the rebound damping adjustment and it has preload adjustment. So it's kind of interesting. On the front forks, you can adjust compression but not rebound. On the rear shock, you can adjust rebound but not compression. So a little bit strange there, and it'd be great if it was fully adjustable, but again, you're looking at brand new, only 5,500 US dollars. So it's quite a bargain, so don't expect too much. And if you look at the Honda CRF 300 l the suspension is really soft and it's non-adjustable, which is a big thing that I think sets this Kawasaki apart from the Honda. Now stay tuned, because I'm gonna have a review on the Honda 300 l and hopefully the 300 Rally, and I'll be able to compare the bikes. Okay, so let's hit the trail. But I think this is going to be representative of what most people would ride on on a bike like this. So let's go ahead and uh, get riding. One of the first things that I notice when I start riding the KLX in the dirt is that it's just playful, fun, easy and just not stressful like if it moves around like that it's okay it's not too big not too tall you can still <laughs> have fun and carry the front wheel up over stuff like if you're really careful with how you use the throttle these stock tires are pretty limiting if I'm honest in this kind of stuff But it's plenty quick to still get you in trouble. The suspension feels nice and plush and supportive until you start riding really aggressively. When you start riding really aggressively, what'll happen is, the first thing that'll happen is you'll start to bottom out the rear shock. But for a budget dual sport bike, the suspension is not budget at all. It's very good. I think where you'd have an issue with the suspension would be like if you're gonna try to go like race the bike in the desert at high speed. It's not really a motorcycle for that. But for stuff like this, it's all the bike you need. It has just enough engine and just enough suspension to just do the do the job. Um, has enough ground clearance, just enough capability, right? That's like the theme of this bike. It's, it's just enough for what you need to do. It's easy enough for beginners to ride on the dirt or even on the street, but I think, oops, I think it will also make more experienced riders like myself very, very happy. Even if you're coming off, you know, a faster, more race-oriented bike like a Husky or a KTM, it doesn't have the power of those, but it's smoother, easier to ride, uh, and honestly, I think it's more fun most of the time. <laughs> uh, I love this bike. It's harder to get into trouble because there's no whiskey throttle moment. If you've ridden the KTMs and the Huskies, they have like a whiskey throttle and you can easily loop yourself over and get in pretty hurt by just grabbing too much throttle. But with this bike, you can just <laughs> use all the power pretty much it's enough power to be entertaining but not too much power that you constantly feel like you're on the edge of disaster and that's why i like the klx god this is fun Oh man, too much fun. It doesn't feel like a total dog. You don't have to redline it all the time, like kind of the 250s always felt. 
The 250s just always felt a bit doggy. This doesn't, I mean, it doesn't feel fast, but it doesn't feel slow, if that makes sense to you. One of the best things about this bike is that the seat height isn't all crazy high. The KTMs and Huskies are 38 inches, something like that, and even for someone like me who's 5 foot 11, I can't really barely touch the ground on those. And that's very intimidating uh, when you try to come to a stop or when you're on a tricky trail. But this, I can always get my feet down. And that adds a whole level of confidence. <laughs> See, I kind of bottomed the shock a little bit there. Oh, the water. Well, that's a good spot to shoot a little b-roll here. That was perfect timing. I didn't expect to see any other riders out here. So let's jump on here and talk a little bit about the ergonomics controls and the dashboard of this bike. So one of the things you're going to notice on this bike is that the seat height is a very reasonable 35 inches. So at 5 foot 10, 5 foot 11 on a good day, I can flat foot this bike on both sides. And that's a really nice thing because on something like a Husky or KTM, like an EXC, they have like 38 inch seat heights. And so on those bikes, you're way up in the air and you're just, you're on your tippy toes and it gets kind of tiring over time. It just gets kind of old. So I really appreciate having the lower seat height of this bike. It still maintains enough ground clearance to do the trails that you need to do for the most part, except in extreme cases. And it has just enough suspension travel that it's plush off road, good control on the road, but it's not so much suspension travel that the seat height is jacked way up. So how do you interface with the bike? How do the controls feel? So you've got kind of standard rubber grips, which aren't that great. Um, you know, typical levers, they're fine, non-adjustable. The mirrors are, they're buzzy at highway speeds. That is a complaint that I have, and I'll probably talk about that later. That's only a problem at higher speeds on the highway. The foot pegs are small. It's kind of what you expect on a budget bike, but even more expensive bikes still have small foot pegs, so that might be something we want to look at replacing. The switch gear is typical Japanese, just very basic, decent quality, nothing, nothing special, but also nothing wrong with it. The handlebars are like a steel handlebar, I believe, and they're a little bit lower end. But again, we're talking about a budget bike, so don't expect like a full aluminum handlebar. It does have this cross brace here. The bars, honestly, were fine. I don't think I would change them if it was me. So talking about the seat, is the seat comfortable? Well. That's a personal thing and it's gonna be up to you to decide that if you get one of these, but I will tell you that after about two hours, I started getting pretty sore on the seat. So I think that if you're gonna be putting in like all day rides, it's very likely that you're gonna to have to maybe look at getting an aftermarket seat. But again, that's gonna be a very personal thing and I can only tell you how I felt about it. I like the dashboard of this bike. Uh, unlike the new KLR, the bike does have a tachometer. Uh, it's an LCD display. It gives you a trip meter, odometer, uh, it gives you a clock, it gives you a good speedometer and the tack. Uh, what it doesn't give you is a fuel gauge, but it does have a fuel light. So you've got the dummy lights here or the indicator lights for low fuel, uh, overheating, high beam neutral and turn signal. The fuel light for me would come on around 80 miles, but we'll talk about the range a little bit later. All right, let's hit some twisty roads. So, gonna hit up Highway 243 from Banning. Great motorcycle road, really good to surface. We'll be able to use all the power of the KLX, which makes it a lot of fun. The fact that you can use all of the horsepower almost all of the time, even coming out of corners. Because, you know, it's the old saying that it's more fun to ride a slow bike fast than to ride a fast bike slow.
I had a major problem with my helmet audio on this run. I'm getting a new helmet microphone set up, but in the meantime, I'll give you a little voiceover. The KLX works great on the street. The fun thing about it is that you can use all the power. The stock tires are also really good on the street too. These Dunlop 605s provide good grip around corners and they don't feel too much like a knobby tire. Of course, the downside is off-road, as you saw, they don't work all that well. In terms of power for the street, the bike has just enough power to keep you going at the speed limit in most areas. It starts to run out of power somewhere around 70 or 75 miles an hour where the engine starts to feel really strained. I think the stock gearing does a good job compromising between low end power and having enough cruising gear on the sixth gear. This bike is fun to ride on twisty roads like this because again it's so engaging because you can just ring the heck out of it. Okay, so we're about to jump on Interstate 10. Now, the speed limit, unless there's construction in this area, speed limit's probably 70. So this would be a good test to see how this bike can cope with the US freeway system. So I'm gonna give it, give it the beans here. So the big question is, does the bike have enough power for higher speeds on the freeway? And I think the short answer is yes, most likely. So I was able to accelerate up to 80 miles an hour pretty easily. Now, if you're going up a steep grade, or if you're carrying luggage, or if you're going into a strong headwind, those are all gonna greatly impact your ability to maintain those types of speeds. But I think if you just wanna cruise around 65 to 70 on your highway system, I think you're gonna be okay with that. The RPMs are up there pretty high, but because the bike redlines at 10,500, it actually is not as bad as it might seem, although you are getting into the upper RPM limits there around 80 miles an hour or so. If you need to do some light duty commuting, or maybe on your dual sport or adventure rides, you need to do some highway sections, I think this bike will be adequate, but you're not gonna keep up with your buddies on their twin cylinder or multi-cylinder adventure bikes. There's no wind protection obviously on this bike and the mirrors are really buzzy and you know it's not the greatest cruising bike for the highways but we know that this is a small displacement dual sport bike but overall i think it does a good job of acquitting itself on freeway systems like this and dealing with the roads dealing with the traffic and the wind in the best way that it can and it has just enough power to carry you along so one thing i didn't mention yet is the braking system so the brakes use these pedal style rotors uh, the front has a twin piston caliper and the back is a single piston caliper and it has a nice little guard on it. The way the brakes feel is that they're progressive, they're easy to modulate, they have enough power for the street for obviously riding with one person. The bike does have passenger pegs, which I found interesting, but I wouldn't be taking a passenger very much on this bike if it was me, uh, just because it's really kind of a smaller motorcycle with not a lot of power. But the brakes are great i wouldn't change anything with the brakes they have a good field and there's plenty of power for the highway so there really is a lot to love about this new klx 300. the first thing for me is just how easy and fun and playful it is to ride it doesn't take itself too seriously and if you've ridden some of the other high performance dual sport bikes out there i think you might know what i'm talking about the engine is smooth tractable it doesn't have a ton of vibration it has just enough power, but not too much power, if that makes sense. And I think for most people, for a dual sport bike, this is probably just the perfect amount of power. If you're a good rider, you can use all the power on the street and off-road within limits, obviously. And I just find it to be kind of the perfect all-around dual sport bike that doesn't cost an arm and a leg and doesn't have high maintenance. Another thing I love about this bike is how engaging it is to ride. So what do I mean by that? Well, the fact that it has just the right amount of power where you have to use all of it or you can use all of it makes it more fun because when you're riding a really really fast high performance bike and you're always using like one fourth of the throttle it to me that's just not as much fun what are the other things i love well i love the fuel injection that's great i love that it's a six speed versus some of the older bikes were five speeds and the drz still a five speed i really like that it allows you to have a low enough gear for most off-road situations but also a high enough gear to cruise on the freeway. Another thing I love about the KLX is the maintenance intervals are very, very long. 
if this is not your European dual sport bike where you're doing oil changes every 600 miles, valve checks every 1,000 miles or 2,000 miles, tearing down the engine every five or 10,000 miles. I've been through that, I've been there, done that. And the beauty of this is that it's a simple, reliable, affordable Japanese bike. The engine is basically like more of a street bike engine and it's designed to have those long maintenance intervals, long service intervals. And that's a godsend for a lot of us who really just don't have the time or want to spend the time always working on our bikes or always taking it into the dealer. And of course, while I'm talking about things I love, I just have to mention the price. At 5,600 US dollars, this bike is a bargain. It's a steal. I mean, what can you get for that, honestly? It costs less than a DRZ. It costs less than a WR250R before it was discontinued. I mean, it's crazy. It has adjustable suspension. It's got a torquey, powerful, just powerful enough motor. It has good brakes. Um, you can ride it pretty aggressively off-road. It's got that low maintenance. I just think it's a killer bike for the price, and I really applaud Kawasaki for putting this out there, and I think they're gonna sell every single one they make. So with my reviews, I always talk about some things that I don't like, or maybe suggested improvements that they can make to this bike later down the road. The first thing for me that sticks out is the fuel tank. So at two gallons, including the reserve, the fuel tank's just a bit small for dual sport riding or even for commuting. I was getting over 60 miles a gallon, even riding the bike hard. I was getting high 50s to around 65 miles per gallon riding this bike. But even getting that good of mileage with two gallons, your fuel light's coming on around, around 80 miles or so on the tank, your fuel light comes on. And from that point, you get kind of uncomfortable and you're probably gonna be getting fuel um, before 100 miles, probably well before that. So that means quite a bit of stopping. And for some of the dual sport rides that we have in the USA that I know people like to do because I do them myself and in other countries too, especially like Australia, I know how you guys, you do long distances that's gonna be a no-go. So you're gonna to have to get find an aftermarket tank when they come out for this bike, or you're gonna to have to carry uh, fuel packs somewhere uh, in your luggage or strapped onto your bike. So that's something to keep in mind. All my other stuff is really minor and really small. And when you look at the price of the bike, it's, it's almost not worth mentioning, but the foot pegs could be a bit bigger and beefier. The seat could be more comfortable. The handlebars could be a little bit nicer. The grips could be better. And the mirrors, the mirrors are really buzzy on the highway. You know, I had to laugh when I first got this bike because I think they're using the mirrors off like a 1987 KLR 650. They're the exact same mirrors that the old Gen 1 KLR had. So I don't know, that seems a bit crazy. The mirrors buzz a lot and you really, when you're on the freeway, like above 65 miles an hour, you really can't see what's behind you. So let's talk about the competitive bikes to this. And it's kind of a short list to be honest with you. So. The most obvious direct one is Honda's updated CRF, which is a CRF 300L standard version, which is kind of like this. And then they have the rally version, which is a different subject altogether. The differences are really one's green and one's red. Uh, <laughs> but beyond that, um, the Kawasaki has better suspension. I'm just gonna say that right now, even though I don't have the 300L Honda test bike yet, uh, from reading, and talking to riders that I know and reading the reports on that, the suspension's pretty soft on the Honda. It's also not adjustable. So at least on the Kawasaki, you get some damping adjustments, which I found to be very useful. I've also found the suspension for me, at least at my weight, around 190 pounds, although that's at risk here, uh, to be very, very good, supportive in all conditions and just enough that you can ride it aggressively, but also not harsh. It doesn't feel like a race bike that's always rattling your teeth out. So. The suspension is great for me and if I bought this bike, which I probably am going to buy one of these because I just love it so much, I'm probably going to leave the suspension totally alone and just save your money for gas or trips or riding gear or something else. So what about the WR250R? So Yamaha made that bike up through 2020. I don't know if there's any new ones still left for sale, but of course you're going to find a lot of used ones out there. So I've owned the WR250R and I just never gelled with that bike. It's a great motorcycle, it has a lot going for it. It has, uh, the engine is pretty powerful, pretty good horsepower, although I will say that this bike feels like it has better low and mid-range torque, which I prefer to the more revvy nature of the WR250, but that's just me. The Yamaha has great like electrical capacity for those of you who were using it as adventure bikes, running heated grips and heated uh, clothing and things like that, and I'm not sure the capacity on this, although I'm gonna put it here in the video if I, if I can find that out. The Yamaha suspension 
is a little bit longer travel, I believe, but the suspension feels better controlled to me than the one on the Yamaha, and I actually prefer riding this off-road to the WR250. So some people would disagree with me on that, take it with a grain of salt, but now of course, yes, I have to talk about the DRZ400. So even though the DRZ400 came out like a billion years ago, and I've been baking Suzuki to update it, which I actually think they probably are gonna bring out some sort of an updated dual sport bike in that size range. I just don't know any details about it. But anyway, compared to the DRZ. So the DRZ is more powerful and has more torque. The suspension on the DRZ is good. It's, it's pretty good. It has full adjustments and has a little bit more travel and, and suspension on the DRZ I would say is better than this. But here's the thing about the DRZ that I don't like and I've owned two of them. The DRZ is very, very buzzy on the highway. Anything, if you gear the bike so that it's good in the dirt and on single track and stuff, fifth gear, because it only has five speeds, is so buzzed out on the highway. I hated riding that bike over like 60, 65. It just felt like crap to me. Again, just me, some people have done it. But when I ride this bike on the freeway, I feel like, okay, like it's working hard, but I don't feel like crap. I don't feel like I'm just rattling my feelings out like I did with the DRZ. So, the six speeds is great. So the DRZ is carbureted. I don't like carburetors. They don't react well to changes in altitude, which I mean, look where I live. I'm always changing altitude. If I leave my house, I go from 6,000 feet down the valley floor to sometimes sea level. So I like fuel injection. It starts properly and it adjusts the fueling as the altitude changes. And it's simpler than a carb and it breaks down less in my experience. So I don't like carburetors. I don't want anything to do with them. Some of you love them and that's fine, I respect that. But the fuel injection is a huge thing. And for all the reasons I mentioned, I would take this any day over the DRZ. Now, if Suzuki updates the DRZ, we're gonna have a whole different ball game on our hands. So please, Suzuki, if you're listening, update the DRZ, we all want it. And you need to get in there and compete with the Kawasaki and the Honda. So here are my final thoughts on the Kawasaki KLX 300. I know a lot of you and myself included either own or have owned bikes like KTM's 350 or 500EXC, maybe a Husqvarna, maybe a Beta, those high maintenance, high power European dual sport bikes where you're always doing maintenance and there always seems to be something going wrong with it. It is true that those bikes have a ton more power. They have more suspension travel. They are, as KTM likes to say, ready to race. But how many of us are actually racing? Let's be honest about this. Do you need to be riding a race bike on smooth fire roads where Subaru Outbacks are going by the other direction. I just don't think so. So many people are riding high performance race bikes and doing all the maintenance that comes with that and paying the extremely high entry price that comes with that for no actual reason other than, you know, people told them it was a good dual sport bike. And it is, it is a good dual sport bike. And I love KTMs and Huskies and all those high performance bikes, they have their place. But unless you're desert racing and going 80 miles an hour through whoops and going through sand washes at 70 miles an hour and you need that kind of power and performance and suspension travel, then a bike like this is gonna serve you better because it's low maintenance, you don't have to rebuild the engine all the time, you can reach the ground, it's not way up in the air, uh, it's more playful, it's more engaging, and I just think it's gonna serve you better in the long run than some of those bikes. So take stock of your actual riding needs, how you actually ride. This bike will go on single track, it'll go on fire roads, Jeep roads, it'll go on the freeway, it'll go down the highway. And I think it's gonna be more than enough to meet maybe 80 to 90% of dual sport riders needs. Again, if you're racing, there are race bikes out there, but so many of us are not racing. And being honest with you, I'm having more fun riding this than I had riding my 500 EXC, which I had last year. So in closing, I think it's great that Kawasaki updated the KLX and gave it a bigger engine and updated some other things on it. I hope they continue to develop this platform. I think it's a great platform from them, even though it is a little bit dated. I'm glad Honda has the 300 and I'm looking forward to testing that. And please Suzuki, update the DRZ because that's what we need. We need more affordable, reliable dual sport bikes that for the every man and every woman and not these crazy European race bikes that honestly, none of us can even use that capability. So please manufacturers, if you're listening, put more of these bikes out there. Anyway, I hope this review was useful. I hope it was informative. I'm trying to really up my game with these reviews and I wanna be one of the best motorcycle reviewers on YouTube. So please give me feedback. Let me know what I'm doing good, what I'm not doing well, what I can improve on. 
what you'd like to see in future videos, what kind of bikes you'd like me to review, and if there's anything I can change about the format, please let me know. Uh, you can help the channel out by becoming a Patreon supporter below. You can subscribe if you haven't already. Give the video a thumbs up, leave a comment. Those are all ways to help the channel. So thanks again, ride safe. We'll see you on the next review and we'll see you out on the trail.